Will I believe you when you say your hands will guide my every way? Will I receive the words you say every moment of every day? And I will walk by faith. Welcome to all of you here, those of you joining us online for this Lord's Day celebration of the corporate gathering of the Real Tree Church. We're going to be looking at Psalm 110 today, but before we do, I'd just like to share one announcement there. We've got the date set for the beginning of the fall Bible studies, October 3rd, Wednesday night, 630 to 8. Pastor will conduct an adult study, and we'll have the Wow Kids meeting again to celebrate our risen Savior. You know, part of what this psalm says, a portion of it says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. Well, we are in the day of his power, and we're looking for people who want to offer themselves freely. A couple weeks from now, we're going to have some sign-up sheets. We're kind of calling it a little bit of a rally Sunday because we need volunteers to help us with some of our ministries. And uh, since I lead or head up, my wife and I head up one of those ministries that has an urgent need, I just want to take a minute to ask those of you that might volunteer or volunteer again to host homes for the uh, the branching out fellowships that we have October, January, April, and July. And uh, now these are held the third full weekend of each of those months. So you can volunteer, put it on your calendar, and then it's a priority. And if anything else comes up, you can say, oh, no, I can't do that. I'm hosting. So that's the kind of volunteers we're looking for. 
That's the kind of volunteers we've had a few of and still do. But we're to that point where these things, since we started them last spring, they've been fairly successful from a body count point of view and from a fellowship point of view, and that's what they're for. Uh, we've averaged nearly 60 people in attendance at these gatherings when we've had them. That means we always need about six homes, five besides ours. We're committed to being there every time if we can, health and the Lord willing. But uh, we kind of hit a snag and we lost some momentum when they uh, decided to do this thing. So uh, I'm just asking in advance, give it a little, you got a little while to think it over, but we're going to start making some calls and invitations first week in October for the October Branching Out Fellowship. You know, Psalm 110 has more New Testament confirmation of its author, genre, and approximate date of writing than any other psalm that we've studied so far. In Matthew 21, verses 41 through 45, in Mark 12, verses 35 through 37, and in Luke 20, 41 through 44, all three synoptic gospels, Jesus himself not only confirms King David's authorship of this psalm, but he also implies the psalm's prophetic and messianic genre by applying the first verse to himself. The Apostle Peter also testifies to Davidic authorship and the psalm's messianic prophecy in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 34 and 35 also quoting verse 1 of today's psalm. And the writer of the letter to the Hebrews refers to this psalm's fourth verse in explaining Christ's fulfillment of the Messianic king's dual role as high priest after the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews 5, verses 5 and 6, and chapter 7, verse 17. So accepting the fact that David was the author, would date the psalm as being written sometime between about 1035 B.C. and 961 B.C., which are fairly reliable dates of David's lifespan. The occasion of the writing, its original audience are, of course, much less reliable. And as usual, scholars, commentators, and others have had a virtual heyday regarding these two aspects of the psalm. The two speculations that make the most sense to me are, number one, it was written shortly after God, speaking through the prophet Nathan, affirmed his covenant to David. Or, number two, David wrote it for Solomon's coronation. Both David and Solomon partially fulfilled what is written here. Although prior to them, Saul attempted to act as both king and priest, but was heartily rebuked by Samuel for his misguided effort. I believe for us as Christians, the messianic role of this psalm should stand out. In just seven short verses, it literally screams that the Messiah who we know as Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, operating as both our King and High Priest, is the only one, both fully God and fully man, anointed and appointed, who is worthy of our praise. Let's read Psalm 110. And I'll be using the ESV. The Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn, and I will not and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand, he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Father God, we thank you. That part of that victory has already taken place. As King David wrote nearly 3,000 years ago, your spirit wrote this psalm. 
as messianic, as pointing, as the Spirit always does, to Jesus, the King, the priest, the only priest, can fulfill and has fulfilled being after the order of Melchizedek. No beginning, no end, only Christ. Father, we just ask that you would join with us and the psalmist as we celebrate your soon coming final victory, the consummation of all things when you take your enemies to task. And Father, we thank you that the wrath that should have been ours fell on your son. We thank you, Jesus, for justifying us before the Father. Father, we thank you for adopting us into your family. We thank you that with this morning we can sing your praises, we can shout your praises, we can read your word and study your word and exclaim your praises through your word. It's by your spirit, through your son, for our good and your glory that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship our great God. Let's sing, sing, sing. Sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. Filled with your 
shown will guard my life and rescue me my broken spirit shouts my mended heart cries out my hope is you show me your way could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory Come on. 
Father, we praise you this morning, Lord, and lift you up. God, we want to give you the glory and all that we say and think and do. God, as we continue to worship you now through the preaching of the word, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to the truth that you have in your text. God, that it may get into our thick skulls and down into our hearts so that we might leave this place and, and be a light shining for you. Lord, we praise you and give you the glory in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you take a, take a second and greet somebody. Say howdy to your neighbor. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to the Real Tree Church. I'm thankful that the Lord has brought you here today to hear from His Word as we continue to work our way through Matthew's Gospel, to study this wonderful Gospel as Matthew's recorded it for us. Uh, today we will be back in chapter 17, uh, looking at verses 14 through 20. So I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 17 and as we prepare to dig into this passage. Matthew 17 verses 14 through 20. Last week in our text, Matthew related to us the incredible scene of our Lord's transfiguration. For the 30 some years that Jesus had walked on the earth as a man, his glory was veiled. That is... If we were to see him, he would look just like any other man while he was on earth. But for one brief moment on the mountaintop, his glory was unveiled. And it was unveiled in the presence of Peter, James, and John. They witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ transform into something completely other. Something that they failed to even grasp words for, really like a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly. For a moment on the top of that mountain, our Lord's true glory and divine nature were revealed to these three men. And they also heard God the Father speak as he told them to listen to what Jesus said. Listen. In other words, they were, they were to obey the Lord in all that he says. We too 
are to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. We too are to do what he says. We're to do what he says to do. And in the passage from last week, there were two principles that I wanted us to try to get a grasp of if we could. First, we need to understand who Jesus truly is. He's God. He is the God-man. He is fully God and fully man. He is creator and sustainer of the universe. And understanding that should drive our worship. If we rightly understand who Jesus is, that should drive our worship. And understanding that leads us to our second principle from last week. That is, we need to have the right response to who Jesus is. And the right response is repentance and faith followed by worship. When we understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us, the only response we can have is repentance. That is, turning from our sin and turning to him and trusting or placing our faith in him. Our trusting in him and his sacrifice is the only means of salvation and there is no other. That's it. And our genuine repentance and faith will necessarily lead to true and proper worship. We must rightly understand who Jesus is and we must respond rightly to that knowledge. In our passage this week, our Lord is dealing with the needs of the people again and the lack of faith, as we will see, of the disciples. And we'll notice, if we kind of look back up out of the text and take a 20,000-foot view, that from this point in Matthew's gospel through chapter 20, our Lord gives special attention to the disciples about living in the kingdom. In other words, his, his focus in his ministry goes from the public down to just the disciples, mostly. They are soon to be without the physical presence of the Lord Jesus, and so he begins to prepare them for that coming time. Well, let's go now to our text. I invite you to stand with me in reverence for the reading of the word of the living God. Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and, kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why can we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed... You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. This is the word of the living God. Heavenly Father, as we dig into this text now, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your truth. God, help us to understand what you have in it for us and, and, and let it penetrate our hearts. And God, if there are some here who don't know you or are listening online, Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself today, that you would open their hearts and minds, that that, the, that your word might pierce their hearts and that they might be redeemed today. We plead for the souls of the lost. And God, as always, we want to glorify you in everything that we say and think about and do. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do that, that you would grant us repentance and increase our faith, that we might not be people of little faith, but people of great faith. And Lord, we give you the glory in all things and pray that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. People who claim to be Christians are to be people of faith, right? That seems like a no-brainer. When we hear someone is a Christian or claims to be a Christian, we assume then that that person is a person of faith. But what does it mean to be a person of faith? What does that mean? After all, Muslims are people of faith, are they not? Great faith, you might say. Buddhists, people of faith. Hinduism, Hindus, people of faith. There are a lot of people who claim to be people of faith that perhaps do not adhere or even believe in Jesus. So what does it mean to truly be a person of faith? Well, the first thing we need to do is make sure that our faith is in the right person. 
Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. In other words, Christianity is by its very nature exclusive. It's exclusive. That means that all those other people of faith that I just mentioned, the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists, their faith is in the wrong thing. As a matter of fact, if you were to study it, you would find that it's a man-centered faith. Not God-centered, man-centered. Their faith is futile. It's in vain. So first, our faith has to be in the right person. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, we are to live a faithful life. Our True faith in Christ results in our living a faithful life. That is, we obey Christ. We live our lives in a manner in which we trust in God for everything. So we're to be a a people of faith by placing our faith in Christ, and we are to faithfully follow Christ as we live our lives. And in our text before us today, the disciples are getting a lesson in faith. Let's go back now and dig in a bit. Take a look at verses 14 and 15 together. Matthew records for us, he says, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. So Jesus and Peter and James and and, and John, they come back down from this incredible experience on the mountain to a crowd of people. Uh, The NAS says a multitude of people. In other words, there's a lot of people here. They come back down to him. And Mark's gospel, if we read his account, tells us that there were some scribes and Jewish leaders that were in that multitude, and they were arguing with the disciples who were left there, the nine remaining disciples. So you can imagine the scene. It's like when you've been gone on vacation, and you you come back to work, and it's total chaos, right? That's the scene that Jesus and these three disciples come back to. And out of this mass of arguing people, This man breaks through the crowd, and he falls on his knees before the Lord, and he begs for mercy for his son. I'm reminded of the Canaanite woman who begged our Lord to heal her daughter back in chapter 15. You recall that? Begs for mercy. The ESV says this man's son has seizures and suffers terribly. The NASB says he's a lunatic. The point is the man's son is out of his mind and often falls into fires and waters. There were lots of open fires then. They cooked over an open fire many times. You can imagine that if the boy often fell into fires, that he was surely scarred from all the times that he'd been burnt. There were open wells and cisterns in first century Palestine, as well as rivers and and lakes and streams. So you can imagine that the boy would have had to have constant supervision. Luke's gospel tells us, And behold, a spirit seizes him, and and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. Shatters him. As I thought of this, I thought of the anguish and the hopelessness that this father must have felt. As he surely loves his son and has to see this every day, every day. So he comes to the master for help. But Jesus wasn't his first stop. Take a look at at the next verse, verse 16. The man says, And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. Jesus had already given the disciples the power to do things of this very nature. If you recall, I want to remind you of uh, verse 1 back in chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel. It says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So they had the authority. So what this man was asking of the disciples was not beyond the power the Lord had given them. They should have been able to do it. In fact, they'd cast out demons and healed the sick before. Yet now they failed to appropriate 
the power available to them through the Lord Jesus Christ. And look how our Lord responds in verse 17. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. That is a stinging response, isn't it? Isn't it? Our Lord comes down from the mountain where he has had intimate communion with the Father. He hung out with Moses and Elijah, talked to them, and now he's confronted with this scene. Our Lord was obviously grieved at the lack of faith of the people and the disciples. As a matter of fact, theologian G.C. Morgan notes, he says, He came down the mountain and found himself confronted by that helpless boy, by that helpless father, by that helpless age, by those helpless disciples. Jesus says that this, this entire generation was faithless and twisted. The NAS translates, translates it as unbelieving and perverted. Those words go together. If one is faithless or unbelieving, then that person is surely to be twisted and perverted. Our Lord is by and large speaking of spiritual issues here, as in unbelief and faithlessness leads to spiritual perversion. Those who do not truly believe in God always twist the truth. As a matter of fact, Dr. MacArthur notes, he says, any person who does not genuinely trust God cannot escape having a distorted view of him and his will. You cannot escape it. But this also applies to everyday life. If one does not have a right view of God, then there is no grounding for any type of moral behavior. If your view of God is twisted and perverted, there's no grounding for moral behavior. Is that not what we see today? The generation that we live in today is twisted and perverse. They call things that are righteous evil, and things that are evil righteous. Anyone who claims to be an atheist has no claim whatsoever to morals, because they have no objective grounding for morals. That's exactly what we see today. As time passes, the morals of society change, and they get worse, and they get worse. All the time. You see, the society is godless. And that's reflected in moral behavior or a lack thereof. A twisted and perverse generation. So our Lord asks a couple of rhetorical questions and then he tells the man to bring the boy to him. Bring him here to me. And look at the result in verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. The boy was healed instantly. No matter how powerful the demon was, no matter how strong of a hold it had on the boy, at the word of the Savior, it was gone. It was gone. The demon was compelled to obey the Son of God. And Matthew leaves it at that. He just leaves it at that. But when you go to Luke, and Luke tells us in his account of the event that the crowds were all amazed at the greatness of God. And in the Greek there, it's, amazed doesn't even describe it. They were dumbstruck. They were in awe of what they had just witnessed. I guess so. To see the power of God at work in someone's life is utterly amazing to me today, as it should be. But the story doesn't end there. Take a look at verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? I'm sure they were confused. They'd cast out demons and healed people before. Why, why couldn't they get it done here with this boy? And look at how our Lord responds to them in verse 20. He said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. 
Note that our Lord says because of their little faith. He does not say because of their lack of faith. They had faith. They obviously, with the exception of Judas, had saving faith. They had trusted in Christ for salvation and even made the claim by way of Peter, remember, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had faith. And they also had trusting faith in what they were learning day by day. They were learning day by day to trust in Jesus to meet their needs. So they had saving faith and they had trusting faith. They just didn't have enough faith as of yet to do what needed to be done in the case of this demon-possessed boy. Their faith was diluted with the thinking of the world. It was mixed with doubt. The faith of the disciples was still fragile. If their faith was like a grain of mustard seed, they would have been able to succeed. And remember, from our study of the parable of the mustard seed, that it was a, it's used as a metaphor for something that started small and grew, in, and grew into something very large, and, and in this case, very powerful. Faith starts small but grows into great faith. And when it grows into great faith, then it can accomplish anything. And our Lord goes on then to use another metaphor that was used during that time and was very well understood. As soon as he said this, they would have known what he was talking about. He says that if the disciples had faith like a mustard seed, they could move mountains. First, it shouldn't need to be stated, but it does. Our Lord is not speaking about the ability to actually move a literal mountain. Okay? That would be a sign like the Pharisees were asking for back in chapter 16. You remember that? Some kind of a great sign. We know that our Lord did not respond well to that. It's a metaphor that speaks of nothing being too great of a task. I had a guy send me a message one day asking me if he could fly. My first response was, sure, go get in an airplane. He said, no, no. I said, flap my arms and fly. He wanted to know that if, his, if it was because his faith was not great enough, because Jesus said that if his faith was great enough that he could move a mountain. So if he could move a mountain, surely he could fly. That's no joke. That happened. Now, I'm not sure why, you know, when he tried to literally move a mountain and it didn't happen, why he would then think that he could fly. But he was serious. What Jesus was talking about is mountain-sized difficulties. When faith is persistent and never gives up, growing day to day, that type of faith will make it so that nothing is impossible within the will of God. Within the will of God. Now, if you're reading from the ESV, you will notice that there is no verse 21. Do you see that? Just a footnote. Skips verse 21 and goes right to verse 22. If you, are, if you have an NASB, you, you'll notice that verse 21 is in brackets, or it should be. The NIV doesn't have verse 21 at all. The Holman Christian Standard has it in brackets. And the King James Version and the New King James Version just listed as a verse making no distinction. Well, the mystery verse here, verse 21 says, But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, let me take a moment and explain this to you. Biblical scholars have access to over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Ancient Greek manuscripts. Over 5,000. That is a lot of copies to compare to and make sure that we can determine what the original authors wanted us to know. As a matter of fact, no other ancient writing even comes close to having this many ancient manuscripts. Not even close. In the older and most reliable manuscripts of Matthew, there is no verse 21. That tells us that Matthew most likely didn't write that verse. It wasn't recorded in his original writing. However, we also know that in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts of Mark's gospel, the phrase, but this kind does not go out except by prayer, is included. There's no evidence in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew or Mark that fasting is mentioned at all. It's also quite likely that Mark was the very first gospel written. It's the oldest. 
So what we have here is an example of scribes adding to this account from Mark's gospel and including a bit of their own thinking. They happen to throw in fasting. And because we have so many manuscripts, we're able to determine with a great degree of accuracy what was originally included, what the original authors wanted us to know. In this case, it's quite likely that the phrase about prayer was included because Mark records it. But there was nothing mentioned about fasting. Matthew doesn't include the verse about prayer because his focus is on faith, not prayer. That's why it's not included. And all of that to say, I want to explain that to you because I want you to know that we can fully trust our modern translations to be absolutely accurate. We have really good translations that are very accurate. So, what can we take away from our text today and apply to our lives as we go throughout our week? I want us to understand that there are two types of faith that we need to be aware of and practicing. First, we need to have saving faith. That is, we need to come to the understanding that we are sinners and are separated from God and heading to hell. It's not that we sin occasionally that makes us sinners, okay? I want us to understand that. It's not that we sin occasionally that makes us sinners, but rather it is that we, we are sinners by nature. It is our very nature, and that's why we sin. We lie, steal things, don't love God the way we should. With all, our, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Don't love each other the way we should. Speak poorly of one another, etc., etc. We do those things or fail to do the things that we should because of our sin nature. When we understand that, then we need to understand that the wages or the penalty for that, our sin, is death. Not annihilation. Not death is in annihilation, but rather an eternal death in hell. And we also have to come to, this, to the realization that there is absolutely nothing that we can do about it in and of ourselves. In other words, you can't be good enough. You can't do enough good things. You can't get sprinkled as a baby and make it. You can't get baptized as an adult and make it. That ain't the way it works. You can't do it in and of yourself. And when we fully understand that truth, then, then the, the good news makes sense. Then the gospel makes sense. It's like knowing that you're sick and then, oh, okay, I'll take the medicine. We are sick. And when we start to understand that, then we can begin to understand the sacrifice that was given for us. That is Jesus. Now, he came here as the God-man, and he lived a perfect life in thought, word, and deed. Imagine that. Never even had a bad thought. And he died the perfect death becoming the perfect sacrifice that stood in our place and paid for the sins of all those who will repent and trust in him. When you understand that and trust in Jesus, that's the first kind of faith. That's saving faith. It has to begin there. It begins with saving faith. We all need to have saving faith. If you're here or listening online and do not, then I urge you to repent from your sins and trust Christ right now. Don't wait. Do it right now. Today's the day. Now is the accepted time. The second kind of faith and the faith that Jesus is teaching us here in Matthew's account is a trusting faith, a, a day-to-day living faith. It's an, an abiding faith. It is that everything that we do is done trusting God for the glory of God. This kind of faith is, is persevering. It's trusting. It's abiding every day. It's an everyday living kind of faith is what Jesus has in mind when he says, then that nothing will be impossible for you at the end of verse 20. Just let that sink in for a moment. If you and I fully trust in God to do what he says he will do, then nothing is impossible. That's not to say that we'll be able to flap our arms and fly. But it is to say that nothing within the will of God is impossible. Anyone who claims the name of Christ has great faith when things are going right, do they not? When everything is hunky-dory, it's pretty easy to say, oh yeah, praise God. 
But how about when everything goes in the tank? How about when it seems like as though the world is crashing down around you? How about when a loved one dies? A child, a parent, a spouse. How about you lose your job, have no money, no food? You're about to lose your home, your health is gone, your family's disowned you, and your reputa reputation is wrecked. What's your faith like then? It is during these times that living, enduring faith is put to the test. And the type of faith that the Lord is talking about is the kind that endures through these kinds of trials. It's the type of faith that Jesus is speaking of here when he says that nothing is impossible. That kind of faith. Great faith trusts in God in all things, in all circumstances, and for all time. We live in a godless society that attacks our faith at every turn. To have a biblical worldview is to be under constant attack from the culture around us, constantly. It is indeed a faithless and perverted generation in which we live, without a doubt. Everywhere we go and everywhere we look, our faith is under attack. Sometimes it might feel as if you're hanging on by your very fingertips at the very end of the rope. But hang on, you must. Hang on, you must. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Search the scriptures. Study them. Write them on your heart and in your mind. Seek God in prayer. Persevere. Never let up, give up, or shut up when it comes to the things of God. Have a living, abiding faith that's obedient to the word of God. Trust Christ in Christ alone for salvation and trust Christ in Christ alone for your day-to-day -day living. When you do that, nothing is impossible for the cause of Christ. I urge you to repent and trust in Christ today. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are with us, that you are worthy, that you are able. Uh, we can trust you in all things, in all ways, every day, all day. That nothing surprises you, that nothing is too hard for you, that nothing's impossible for you that you have all this, that you own everything, that you have our best interest in mind for our good and your glory. Lord, we are thankful. And Father, we praise you and want to glorify you because of that. Lord, help us to understand who you are and the sacrifice that has been given for us. Lord, open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to know you more, to know you better. Help us to live that life day to day. Give us courage and boldness to share the gospel with those around us, to pull them from the fire, to be a life-saving station. Lord, we again give you the glory in all things, and we pray that your will would be done in our lives every day, all the time. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to get the ushers to come forward, please.
the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. We'll see you all next week. Lord, bless your week. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who lives forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Children play and the flowers grow. It's even greater than my mind can see. Way past the clear blue sky where the people laugh and they never cry. There's even a perfect place made just for me. But I'll never get there on my own. Only through God alone. And I'll be singing. At times I must admit It's easy to forget This life I'm living now is a new end Heaven has so much more I wonder what's in store It's hard for me to even comprehend But I'll never get there on my own no. Only through God Yeah, man, you have a good trip.
trust in Christ alone for your day-to-day living. When you do that, nothing is impossible for the cause of Christ. I urge you to repent. also applies to everyday life. If one does not have a right view of God, then there is no grounding for any type of moral behavior.